quickly as I can. And if there are questions, there are questions. So uh, the first presentation here is to safety first, and it really reviews what the code authority did when they looked at freight elevator door safety. So the first third of this is sort of the way things were, uh, what the code committee did, and then what Peely did to address what the code committee was asking. So jumping right into it, let's talk about history. And, you know, this is uh, Elijah Otis here, you know, demonstrating his safety at the uh, World's Fair, whenever it is that he did this. And the purpose of this slide is, you know, safety has been around a long time and, you know, we didn't know, we didn't know, and it, it really evolves. And that's really the first part of this presentation is sort of the way it was. And then we talk about the way it is today. And this first operation, ASME 2.13.3.2, I am not gonna read this stuff, but this is how freight doors were controlled initially. Constant pressure on the button to close the doors. If you reversed your finger on the button, the door reopened. Only the button at the door and at that floor and on that side of the elevator would work that door. And then these things changed over time. And I do wanna point out one thing that the code speaks to. It talks about car doors or gates in the way of definition when Peely talks about something that it refers to as a car door, that is probably something that is solid and the full height of the opening versus a car gate, which is probably six foot high and wire mesh. So that's how we would define those as difference. All right, so that is the first way that doors were operated, which was constant pressure. Later on, the rule was changed to 2.13.6, which was sequence operation. And sequence operation really said that the door would close after the car gate. So car gate closes first, then door. And this was obviously a safety requirement. And in doing this, the code only required door manufacturers such as ourselves to protect the car gate. So if you have sequence operation in that the gate closes first, then doors, and then the reverse is true in opening, the manufacturer only needed to protect the car gate. That will be important later when you see the code work that they did. And that required that the car gate had some sort of safety device on it and that only the landing door required a non-crushing leading edge. I don't know if my cursor is gonna, but do you guys see that, Brad? If I point that out? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So only the door then had a non-crushing edge, but the car gate, had to have a device here on the bottom, which we'll get to in a minute. And that is sequence operation, gate closing before the door. And then later, 2.13.3.4, this is automatic closing. So that means just what it says, that the doors and gates would close automatically. And the code then required that there had to be some sort of audible signal, a bell or a gong of some kind to let people know that the gates and doors would close automatically. If that was the case, sequence operation had to be provided. Of course, the reversing device had to be uh, provided. And then we also did alter how the closing speeds were manipulated. In other words, that the doors and gates would probably close at a different speed slower because they were closing automatically. So that's how doors and gates, uh, their progression has changed from constant pressure to sequence to auto close. And then if you look at our history, now we're talking about the gate because the gate closes first in most cases and how we protected the gate. So there's lots of Peely stuff in the field. We are 117 years old. There's plenty of older stuff, but in the beginning, from the beginning to 1969, we did not have a safety device on the bottom of the leading edge of the gate. You can see that this is just metal and this was constant pressure. It was also simultaneous operation, meaning that when somebody pressed the close button, the door and gate would close together. And however heavy this gate panel was, it had to make and did make physical contact with you and it did not reverse. There was no such thing as sequence operation or automatic closing. So 
you know, they talked about here trained writers. So yeah, trained users is what we had to rely on because they had to recognize that this was not a very safe environment at times. From 1969 to 1993, we then started adding uh, what we would call a reversing edge or a reversing device on the bottom of the gate. However, it did require physical contact with something before it reversed. So again, if this was a 350 pound gate, although it had a reversing edge, a contact had to be made in that device when it struck something to reverse. And still at this time, 1993, we were offering sequence or simultaneous operation, meaning that in sequence, the gate would close first, then the doors, or simultaneous, the doors and gates close together. In 1994 to 2001, pre-light curtain, Peely had designed what's called a sensor beam. And if you can see that one half of the beam is here, it was a device that slid down from a tube in the gate panel. There was a sender and a receiver, and there was a safety zone of about six inches. So this was the first time our car gate would not need to make contact with a person or an object before it reversed. And we also decided that sequence operation would be standard at that time. Uh, in 2001 to 2008, uh, we started adding light curtains to our products. We did that and it covered from 25 millimeters off the floor to about 1800 millimeters, which is about six feet. So obviously this was good technology and sequence operation was now standard. And, and it's about this time that complaints about being struck by the Peely gate pretty much went away because now we're operating in sequence and we're putting light curtains on. In 2006, we developed a curtain called the protector, which was really suited for anybody's car gate, including manufacturers that were no longer in the business. Gilbert's gone, Otis is gone, uh, Harris Preble is gone, and it allowed elevator contractors to put on a light curtain uh, in the existing gate track without having to replace the gate. So the code folks, wanted a mechanical edge for safety and, and Peely did at least that, but then we developed a sensor beam and a light curtain and then later on a protector. And then the committee went further. So they decided, look, we need to keep people safe in a freight elevator. Uh, and they did that by performing um, an ad hoc committee in 2002. And what this committee did was they assumed no safety devices, they assumed that there were different kind of freight handlers. Freight handlers had different knowledge. They had physical limitations. They had different training. And then they looked at all of the possible ways that you could be injured uh, in a freight elevator. Were you entering, exiting? Were there glancing blows? What part of your body was involved? Uh, how were you actually entering the elevator? Are you squatting, walking, running? They spent a lot of time in how do people use the freight elevator and do people get injured? So they looked at some other standards and this is really all about being struck with either the door or the gate. Cause I do make a note here, once you're in the car and the doors and gates are closed, uh, there's really not much risk to the doors, uh, to you by the doors and gates, unless you're throwing yourself into them, which you know, people don't do. So they really looked at entering and exiting, and what part of your body could get injured. And these guys actually went out and got standards. They actually determined through other standards that the human head is 140 millimeters wide and 170 millimeters tall. And they looked at this detection zone and there are multiple detection zones. And the first one is the head. So what is the exposure the exposure is the head or torso and being swiped by the car gate. So here's the car gate, here's the door. So they looked at the human head and at different heights within the elevator to protect the human head. And when I'm speaking of this, what I'm getting to is as a manufacturer, 
Peely and our competitors, we have to develop a product that protects the human head from being swiped by a car gate. So when you get product from anybody who makes freight doors, they had to look at this standard and say, how am I protecting the human head? So here's the first zone is the human head at various heights and various widths, trying to avoid being swiped by the car gate. The next area of the body they looked at was the torso. So the detection zone is the torso. So we, they figured out how wide a human torso is. They're looking at just about the knee level and they're looking at, here's the gate, here's the door. So we're looking at the torso anywhere along this region for persons in the path of the car gate. And we're trying to protect or recognize the whole body. And we do that at various heights. Again, anybody who's making doors and gates needs to protect the torso. Then they look at the arms. Look, we all do this, right? We're running into an elevator and uh, it's closing. And I know I'm not the only one who, you know, throws your arm, throws your leg in the path of the doors and gates as they close and freight elevators are no different. So they looked at the detection zone being the arms and we're trying to protect anybody from the car gate with arms extended and the exposed part of our body is either the arm or the hand. And they have figured out what that zone is. Anything 480 millimeters off the ground and 210 millimeters in width. And you can see the gate closing in front of those arms. So again, we need to protect the arms when the gate is closing. And then they looked at somebody entering the elevator. So here, the guy's trying to catch the elevator. So as little as 50 millimeters, oops, excuse me, as little as 50 millimeters and 75 to 125 millimeters into the elevator as the gate and or door closes, if we detect a foot anywhere along the width of the elevator platform in closing, that gate would not move because we're looking to protect the closing car gate on somebody's foot or leg. Because you know, once I see your foot, I know your leg is behind it and then your torso is behind that and your head's on top of your torso, right? So if I see your foot when closing, you know, I've got to keep the gate from moving. And then they looked at one other detection area. So here's a guy, I don't know why you would do this, but he put his foot on the platform, straddling the door and the building. And you know, you, uh, you have to plan for stupid. So I guess this is one of those things that they plan for stupid. So if somebody chooses to straddle a freight door by putting one foot on the platform and one foot on the building, and we can detect it, we don't want to hit his head, his leg, or his torso. So, you know, nothing moves. Now, there is a caveat here. If his foot can't fit here, we're not required to look for it. But if it's big enough for a foot, in other words, if it's 95 millimeters and we can't trust that somebody won't put their foot there, we have to not move. All right. Uh, one of the other things they did, and this is rule 2.13.3.4.9, says that any of these devices uh, need to be constantly monitored. And if I can't see it, then the door doesn't move, right? The device shall be checked, capable of sending the defined object. And if it's incapable of sending the defined object, it becomes inoperable, meaning that whatever device a manufacturer put on their system, it's constantly self-checking. And if it doesn't detect that it's working, then nothing operates, which is a, which is a good rule. So they also define some elevators. You know, most of us understand what a freight elevator is. It's restricted to freight handlers, people delivering, truckers. You know, it's usually back of house. We all get that. It's not for passengers. And then we have passenger freight elevators. We've all been in one of those, right? That's a service elevator uh, designed for passengers, rated for passengers. The difference here is that there's probably a solid car door. And then the last elevator they looked at is restricted freight elevators. And these are really in highly industrial environments where there's, excuse me, you know, uh, gas, dust, dirt. Uh, there's probably constant pressure closing. Uh, so that's another type of elevator. Uh, but those are the elevators that this 
effort these hazard zones looked at. And so the committee is, is quite pleased with its work. So what it did uh, in this version of the code is it now requires on all freight elevators with power doors, there has to be a non-contact initiation of reversal. In other words, that if I see a device, I, um, I reverse. We've got to have that test because if I don't know if the device is working, I'm not going to operate. We've got to detect that body, or the body and the head and the foot whole or in part in those detection zones. And we've got to have warning devices and we've got to have buttons in the appropriate place to reverse the doors if they're closing and we see a body. So how did Peely address that? Well, in the 2010 version of, uh, of the code, all of our doors that are biparting are provided with sequence operation with a warning buzzer. We provide two light curtains. We're protecting anywhere from 25 millimeters to six foot above the platform. And we have two beams that are 56 millimeters apart. And of course we have that functionality test. And uh, you know, I don't think that we're any different because anybody in this business has to do the same because this is what the code requires. So here's what our equipment looks like, right? We've got two beams. We're looking at the head, the torso, the foot. We are sandwiching the car gate, one edge in the front, one edge in the back. Uh, as far as the foot is concerned, we have a non-crushing edge on the car gate, but we've also got a light curtain on either side. Now, as far as safety is concerned, uh, the light curtains are standard fare light curtains, but they are, they are affixed to the car enclosure. They ride with the gate. Like I said, we're protecting about six feet off the platform uh, with the functionality test. Um, some manufacturers, us included, are providing warning labels. And these warning labels cover anything from um, watch out for tripping, how to open a manual door. We have to warn people that the gate is closing in automatic operation. These are actual, by the way, these are stick. This is not a cartoon. I'm showing you stickers that we provide with our product that we hope people attach to the inside of the car uh, to keep people safe. Um, in addition to that, we also provide these operating instructions, which are supposed to be affixed inside the car enclosure. All of this is about safety. Our manuals, if you have an environment that have people who speak other than English, our manuals are available in French, German, Spanish, and Chinese. We provide an inspection and a maintenance checklist to ensure that you're looking at the right items. And although the reversing edge which is older technology, which had to make physical contact with somebody uh, has been replaced by light curtains and the protector, which are far safer. The reversing edge is still available. Some people like it for redundant safety. So um, that's still an option today. And I can tell you as a result of these code changes and what we did to our product, uh, we have seen far less complaints, far less lawsuits because the car gate which leads the car door that now has two light curtains on it, uh, reverses before it strikes anybody. So we have far less complaints and product liability claims. Uh, so freight elevators from the beginning to certainly now have definitely gotten safer. And you'll see this stuff on any newer equipment, certainly anything 2010 forward. All right, so that is the end of the first presentation and I can't see you guys. So I will stop sharing to see there, if there are any questions. Oh, there's one chat. So I would like you to look at that. I just posted that. Yeah, so oh. I, does anybody have any questions I could, on this first presentation? If so, feel free to type them in. Before we move on to the next one. Can you see that, Mike? Can Michael comment on how nudging is, ooh, that went away. Uh, how do we get that back, Brad? Unless you can see it. Yeah, I can oh, see it. Oh, got it, got it, got it, question. Uh, can Michael comment on how nudging is applicable to vertical bipartite door operation, how closing uh, the reverse? So uh, my understanding of nudging is if, if the, the light curtain detects something and then you go back and you press that close button again, 
the doors operate nudging. So they're gonna, they're gonna close, but nudge close because it thinks that there's something there. So that operation hasn't changed to my knowledge. Was, was that your question? Yes, thanks, okay. But as a reminder, it had, it had to see something first before it goes into nudging. And then you're in the car, you've pressed the close button again. So the controller is set up to say, okay, I thought I saw something. Maybe I didn't see something. They're still closing the door. So I am gonna close, but I'm gonna close and nudge. And then again, of course, if nudge is closed and it, it hits something else again, it's, it's gonna go back. All right, so let me get to the second presentation. Now, the second presentation is less about safety and more about how we define why vertical doors are still relevant and how many different styles of vertical doors there are because most people don't realize it uh, and they have different applications. So I will put that presentation up now. All right, so share screen. You guys let me know if you see it. Uh, maybe it's this one. Yeah, I think it's that one. Okay, I'm relying on you guys. You see it? Yeah. We can see it. Yeah. All right. All right. So, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, do you see 115 years? Okay, good. All right. Yeah. So uh, the one thing that comes up uh, in this presentations is Pelia, you're still selling a lot of freight doors. And why are you still selling freight doors? So uh, it's interesting that you ask that because of, about 10 years ago, things were really different uh, than they are today. Uh, and, and one of the things that is really quite different is, is how we shop. Um, and nobody would think that this has anything to do with freight elevators, but I have to tell you, um, Amazon has changed the world for everybody, including um, the guys that make freight doors. Uh, and, and really how that affected us is, I can't tell you how much work we have done with the postal service because of how many packages go through the postal service plants because of Amazon and other retailers that are selling things uh, and needing them to be shipped to people's homes. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there isn't few places that you can drive where you do not see an Amazon warehouse. And if you see an Amazon warehouse, for sure, there are lifts in there. Now, they might not be freight elevators, but there are lifts uh, in those elevators. So uh, one of the things that makes freight elevators still relevant is how we shop. Another thing that we've noticed is uh, retail shopping. So yeah, if you have a mall in your neighborhood and all your mall is, is for shopping, it's probably gonna close. What we have noticed is if a mall has entertainment, or high-end goods, or is in a urban center, oh my goodness, I have reversed those advantages and disadvantages. I must have been up late that, that night. So yeah, so the places that are at advantage are urban centers, anything with a lot of tourist traffic, anything with high-end merchandise, and even some of the retailers are now offering same-day pickups. So th those malls are surviving, and if they survive, they are investing in their freight elevators. Another thing we've noticed is people, even after COVID, are now starting to return back to cities, especially as they age. So you know, when they wanna be closer to doctors, culture, transportation, they don't wanna mow the lawn, they don't need the pool, they don't wanna, they don't wanna see their neighbors anymore. So they go into a city uh, and that means the more people that go into a city, they might park a car, and the more people we send into a city, we need to have distribution centers, retail centers, uh, food processing centers. So that drives freight elevator needs. And then of course, you've got lots of cities are just old and a lot of their infrastructure is being replaced. Uh, as an example, I am a New Yorker. Uh, they have replaced, replaced no fewer then three bridges, major bridges that go over like the Hudson River. Uh, if you guys fly into New York, they have rebuilt LaGuardia Airport. It has been rebuilt as it stays open and all of that infrastructure uh, needs elevators 
and the elevators, uh, many are freight. So they're still relevant. So somebody is gonna talk to an architect who's gonna talk to elevator professionals, and then they make a decision as to what kind of an elevator. And uh, you know, for most of us on this call, there are three types of elevator that we see. You know, one is a material lift, and, and this would be kind of sort of what you'd see in Amazon. You know, it's kind of synced with the, uh, 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 an inventory retrieval system. There's no hoistway here. There's no real elevator here other than the lift. There's no doors. So, you know, that's one type of elevator. And then we talked about these service passenger elevators that everybody uses, even the ones that are ugly, that are in the back of house. You know, they're, they're, they're pretty popular and they're pre-engineered by the elevator manufacturer. And then you come to sort of what we do, which is very application specific. You know, some architect, some general contractor, some elevator consultant, some elevator contractor has decided, hey, I've got, uh, I've got so much space, I'm, I'm moving this, uh, and, and this is how big or not my elevator needs to be. And, and for us, we talk about if you're going to use a freight elevator, and it is going to include something on wheels to move things, a hand truck, a forklift truck, a power jack, any of those things where wheels can potentially hit door panels, and if you hit door panels, you're gonna break the door panels. Uh, you might wanna think about vertical doors because we think that's the best solution. So unlike these other two standards, which are pre-engineered and out of the box, you know, the freight elevators are a little bit more custom. You know, you know they're more custom because you know, most of the big guys other than Titian uh, no longer make a freight elevator, a true freight elevator. Tissot is the only manufacturer that makes a freight elevator. Uh, I think Kone's got an MRL that they might sell on occasion, but most of those big companies have determined that you know it's a specialty and we're gonna go to somebody else for that. Most elevators are properly maintained. You know, they'll run all day long. 80 to 90% of shutdowns are related to the doors. And when we talk to a contractor or an owner or a consultant, you know, you, you ask those questions, you know, what are you loading? Is there a risk of, of damaging the door? And really how important is this to the owner? It, it might determine what kind of door they get. Look, if you're running a parking garage uh, and the elevator's out of service, uh, you can't move cars in and out. That's a huge problem. Uh, when we talk to the people uh, at Target, Target department stores, uh, they've given us a price. They've told us it costs us $8,000 an hour uh, when we don't have the use of a freight elevator. So it's a big deal. So they, they take a very close look at the doors. Now, for the next six slides, uh, before I get into door types, the next six slides are all about how we differentiate the vertical door from the horizontal door. And just so I'm not confusing anybody, when I say vertical door, our door slides, uh, half slides up generally and half slides down. So it slides vertically as opposed to horizontal, which is a, a passenger door. So we talk about our door style, uh, the freight elevator door as a vertical slide door uh, versus a passenger door, which is a horizontal slide door. So for us, when someone says, why your style door versus a passenger door, uh, these are the six things. And the biggest one is the construction. The freight door, the vertical slide door, is all steel. It is 12 gauge, it has a trucking sill, it has a steel frame, it has reinforced ribs. It is meant to be driven into. We are expecting that it's gonna be struck by a car, a forklift, a truck, a pallet. It just gets beat up and it's okay if it gets beat up because it'll stand the abuse. Uh, we all know that we've seen passenger doors that are out of service because if two drunk college kids are thrown into some passenger doors and I see Eddie laughing and shaking his head, you know, it doesn't really take too much effort to take a 200 pound drunk college student and throw him into a passenger door before that elevator is really not usable until that panel is repaired or replaced. You know, you can take that same 200 pound drunk college kid and throw him into a freight door and he's gonna have a, a sore shoulder. You know, it's a different kind of door. So our door is made with a flat trucking sill. It's made with a flat trucking sill because you're gonna drive over it and you've got cargo 
driving over that trucking sill. Uh, when you look down at a passenger elevator, it's grooved. It's grooved because the door, the horizontal sliding door is sliding in those grooves. Uh, over time, if you were to truck over it, not only do you wear those grooves out, uh, when you do, it's hard for the doors to close because you're starting to wear the groove out. And you, if, you, if you drop enough junk in those grooves as well, the doors don't close. So the trucking sill is very unique to the vertical door because it's flat, nothing collects in here, and it's meant for the smooth transfer of freight and we're not expecting anything to be sliding on it. So the trucking sill is very different. Our interlock, which is this orange thing here, is tucked on the inside on the, of the hoistway on the rail. It's not attached to the door panel. So if I go back, and I don't want to pick on the 200 pound drunk college kid, but look, somewhere right now, there's a 200 pound drunk college kid being thrown into a, a passenger elevator. Um, so if that kid, hits the passenger door panel enough, you know, he's gonna create a situation where uh, that door is not latched with its uh, operator. And again, it's out of service. You really don't get that with a vertical door because it's protected inside on the rail, not attached to the door panel. So even if you hit the door panel uh, and you were to move it slightly, uh, it doesn't really affect the interlock because it's affected because uh, it's not it's not affected. So the 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 lock is independent of the door panel. So that's unique to the vertical door. Uh, another thing unique is how little space the vertical door actually needs. Uh, most door manufacturers only need the amount of space that their operator takes. So for Peely, we only need 13 inches on either side of the door, regardless of its width. Uh, we made a 30 foot wide door at a helicopter propeller plant, and we still only need 13 inches on either side. If this was a passenger elevator and the panel was 42 inches, it needs another 42 inches inside the hoistway to slide into. And that's a lot of real estate, depending upon you know, what, what, your, what your builder is building here. Sequence operation, we talked about that in the first presentation. So to keep occupants safe, the gate closes before the door, but it also doesn't allow the operator of the forklift to just zoom into the opening when he sees the doors open. When a passenger elevator opens, the hoistway and car doors open together. Not so with a freight. So these guys generally don't charge the opening because if so, they would drive into the car door because it's in their way. And then the last major difference is that the door lock and the car gate lock are independent, not so on a passenger elevator. If you load a passenger elevator with a heavy enough load, it will shift the platform. And if you shift the platform enough, you've seen this where the platform actually rocks back and forth when there's a heavy enough load, the door can come disengaged from the gate and now you have a service call. But for a true freight elevator with vertical doors, those two locking systems are independent. So the door lock and the gate lock never touch each other, don't require each other to be engaged. So it causes less problems when the platform is moved beyond its normal range. And something often asked is, you know, what have you done to make things safe? Well, you saw the safety presentation. So in addition to looking at all of those hazard zones, um, over the years, uh, car gates have gone from a expanded metal to a mesh, to a, a weaved mesh, to a sometimes full height solid panel to keep people safe. We already talked about the reversing edge to a sensor beam, to a light curtain, to dual curtains. We're sometimes making that gate yellow, buzzers, strobes, sometimes the gate is half mesh and half solid. So we've really, because the gate closes in advance of the door, trying to keep people safe inside that car. And then we've done other things like the labels, double locking. We have wireless controllers now. Uh, we are power operating manual doors. And you know, our stuff not only complies with the code here, but also the code in Europe, and they have some interesting enhancements that we use. So let's talk about door styles in and of themselves, which you guys may or may not be aware of. 
There is audio to this presentation, but it's not running, but that's not, that's not that important. So I'm just gonna show you the door styles that you may or may not be familiar. Brad, you still can't hear that, right? Right, I can't hear it. Uh... Okay. So I wonder how I shut her up. Hmm. Okay. So you've just seen the regular door and that's what we would like to see most of the time. Half the door goes up and half the door goes down. That's when you have all of the appropriate space requirements. But when you don't, we have something very similar, which is pass and extended doors, and they're just passing each other. So I'll let you see the, the animation and then I'll explain it. So still regular, but not enough floor space. So they literally just pass behind and in front of each other. So when we do have these passing doors, one of the doors it is extended sill because it requires more space in the hoistway. And you can see that floor above slid down and in front of the door below. Very similar to pass, very similar to regular. And what the animation is showing you here is that when these doors do pass, we provide a fire lintel to make up that gap because that door is set a little further into the hoistway. That's also pretty common. Now the doors get a little bit less common, but you may have seen them in your elevator career. So here's a telco upper, telco meaning telescoping. So here's where you don't have enough room in the overhead for a standard height upper panel. So here we have enough space for the lower panel to slide down, but not enough space for the upper panel to slide up. So the fix is to just have the upper panel in two pieces to accommodate that low overhead. This is a little bit more intricate where we don't have enough room in the pit. We have plenty of overhead space. So there's a couple of different options for this type of arrangement. So you can either get this kind of a door or you can reduce the overall height of the opening. Or another option is to trench the pit. We've actually seen some people trench this pit so it fits there. Now, if you guys have seen enough freight elevators, you know the kind of crap that collects in a pit. So if you collect too much debris in the pit, that lower panel doesn't open fully and now you've got people driving over a lower panel that's partially out of the opening. So that's generally not the best solution. So here is the same type of arrangement, but the upper panel needs more space. So it slides up and in front of the door above it. So this situation is a shallow pit depth and a short floor height. Not a big deal. We just make it sort of one thirds, two thirds where the lower panel slides into the pit and the upper panel slides up and behind the door above it. And what that picture is showing you is anytime there's a gap between the upper panel and the wall, we provide a fire lintel for code purposes to you know, ensure that whatever fire is in the hoistway, excuse me, hoistway, well, hoistway or room doesn't end up in either space. So that is always provided anytime that there's a passing door and a gap between it and the hoistway wall. So this arrangement is where the entire door slides up because you have no pit at all. And the whole door is in the slide up direction. 
Now, what's required here is that the general contractor is going to have to provide a truckable sill to drive from the building into the elevator because the door which normally provides the trucking is now in the slide up direction and it won't be trucked over. Now, when you run out of space to have a single section slide up door, what we provide is a two section slide up door. You still need a building still for trucking, but now both panels are in the slide up direction. So they need to slide up for whatever reason, but there isn't enough space for a single section. And if you still run out of space, the one extra option we have is a three piece slide up door. And again, a building sill is required for trucking into the elevator. So I will tell you in North America, this is highly unusual. This is something that you usually only see in, uh, in Asia. But what we've noticed is as those Asian manufacturers are moving to the States, they sometimes specify this, but I'm showing it to you guys because it's, it's an option. Uh, if you have a situation where there is no pit and there is limited overhead, there is an option for that. Uh, there is another option that I did not show, which is a slide down door. So in other words, you have no room uh, in the upper, uh, in the overhead. So we take the whole door and we slide it in the down direction. And then we're gonna look at car doors. I mentioned before that, that we call a car gate, something that's wire mesh and a car door is solid. And most of you are familiar with this. Most of our car gates are six feet, one piece and they slide up. Very standard, very common. It usually requires the opening height plus six foot one inch. And when you don't have that, when there isn't enough room in the overhead, we can go to what we call a two section gate, two panels of different heights, and they slide up in the other direction and they all rest on the car. Every once in a while, somebody says, do I have to get them in different heights? The answer is no. Uh, we do have what's called a differential. Uh, why that word? I can't tell you. A differential car gate is two three foot equal panels. And the only time I I usually see that is uh, when the architect wants it to make it pretty, right? So that that's an option. And uh, we, we have done a biparting um, car gate. Um, which is, which is interesting. I don't know what the application would ever be, but if anyone ever said, is that possible? Yeah, it's possible, we did it once. Okay, there is an option for a half solid, half mesh car door, if your application so chose. Now this was done for Target, but it was done specifically because the elevator was being loaded and the car gate frame was catching on shopping carts. So we made the bottom half solid so that the gate slid behind those shopping carts. So I can imagine a situation uh, in one of your facilities where uh, if something was pushed up against the gate, the rear gate, and it caught the gate, and it has the tendency to burn out gate motors, that, that this would be a fix for you. Uh, so here are some other options for car doors. Now these would be solid. So imagine passengers riding in what you have as a freight elevator. We would put a solid panel, full height car door in that elevator. It would have a vision panel. It would look just like a passenger elevator, except that car door would slide up in the up direction and would match the mechanics of the hoistway door. Where you didn't have enough room, for a full height car door, uh, we would recommend a two section slide up car door. Same difference, solid vision panel coordinated with the hoistway door. And you would do this because of minimum overhead height.
And you can guess what's coming next. If you really had a short floor, we do make that car door in three sections. One thing to keep in mind, every time we add another panel, you're losing space off the platform. So obviously this gets laid out with the architect or the uh, general contractor or the elevator consultant, but, but it's an option. So um, I, I'm not gonna give you the sales pitch. So um, those are the various kinds of, uh, of doors that we have and car doors and hoistway doors. So if there's any questions, I wanted to leave uh, enough time and, and we have 10 minutes. And there are a couple there, I think. Can you see them? Oh, I do see them. Uh, can you elaborate? Oh, let me go back up here. Do I have to go to the top questions, Michael? No, I'm not nudging. Okay. Can you comment? This is another question here. Can you comment on the yeah. flashing signal that requires where should it be visible from? How bright? Uh, those are great questions. So I would have to get somebody in engineering and get you. I know that we we are, uh, you know, I don't think we're buying anything special. I mean, we're we're generally providing, um, you know, a strobe light. And then I know that the, um, I know that the um, the audible device um, has to be of certain decibels, um, but Matt, I don't know how to get a hold of, of Matthew Pike. But if you if you give me an email, unless it's an email here, we lost your volume. You Sorry about that. There you go. Uh, no, I, I was trying to get a hold of. Uh, I was trying to get a hold of. Uh, if, if Matthew, if you can get me Matthew's um, uh, email, I see he has two questions. Uh, can you elaborate on the enhancements of the door from the European Code? Yeah. Um, so, so Matthew, uh, let's get your email so I can get you that decibel and the brightness of the uh, audible and visual signals for the car. Uh, I can tell you that uh, the European Code, the major differences in the European Code. Are, are mostly gate related. And um, I'll explain it by in our, in our place, um, they, they refer to it as reverse panel. You guys still with me, reverse, reverse panel? Okay, so, so Matthew, what, what the European code requires us to do, if you've ever looked at our gate or anybody's gate, you can see the car gate panel and, and you can see the chain and how the chain connects to the car, the car gate panel, the Europeans require that none of those mechanisms are accessible from inside the car. So in other words, here in North America, if you wanted to, you, you could walk up probably and reach the chain and, and hold it, and you probably could get hurt. Uh, the Europeans require all of that stuff to be not accessible and, and behind the gate, or if you will, along the hoistway wall, so you can't reach it. That is the major difference. Okay, Matthew, I see your email here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna copy that. Copy. All right, let me copy that. All right, Matt, I'm just putting Matthew's uh, name on an email so I don't forget it. All right, let me go back to the presentation. Was there any other questions? Yeah, I have one other question. Uh, it was actually for me, and I'll, I'll read it out to you yeah. uh, the way I wrote it. Does the fire lintel uh, that you mentioned, does that mark the door above it, or does it cause any type of uh, service issues down the road? I, I saw that it was it looked hinged almost, you know, by the display. Uh, so I will tell you that uh, I, I know that it, it shows up on the job site. And I know that we, we often find that it has, it has not been installed. I think it has not been installed because I don't think people recognize what it is. And uh, I, will, I will tell you, Eddie, that over time, we, we replace fire lentils. You're right, it's on a hinge. And if, if this is a parking garage, and that thing is opening 
80 times a day, uh, I'm going to tell you at some point that hinge is going to have to be replaced, right? And sometimes it just gets thrown off, but it's super important um, to retaining the fire, right? So uh, we, we don't send it because we're uh, nice guys. We send it because the code requires it to be provided. And the expectation is that it gets installed. And the expectation is as it wears, uh, you replace it. But yeah, uh, it, it, it'll cause a service issue when that, when that, hinge, when that hinge wears, because it's, it's going to wear uh, based on use. Yeah, and I was thinking more of a lubrication uh, type situation too, especially in a garage. Absolutely. You know, and, and it depends on the environment, right? Like uh, if you, I, I, can, I can envision a parking garage with a floor below and the, the fire lintel is below it. I mean, and it's a parking garage, which means it's exposed to the outside. So you're gonna get moisture, you're gonna get snow, you're gonna get dirt. And sure, that, that hinge is gonna probably need to be replaced uh, more often than not, if it's below an opening versus up in an air-conditioned, uh, climate-controlled hoistway, right? So I don't see any other questions here. Um, I, I saw on your presentation uh, you had your name, address, and all that. But uh, thank you for a fa fantastic presentation. Happy to and, do it. Uh, very informational. Uh, is how just if you can repeat again how anyone who has questions for you or would like to obtain your service how can they get in touch with you oh look you can go to the peely website you know i'm there but you know if you guys need me the email is simple it's uh, m ryan m r y a n at peelydoor.com p-e-e-l-l-e door.com but if you went to the website you know our contact information is there if you if you think of a question uh, that you uh, didn't get a chance to ask or occurs to you after the presentation, uh, I will get back to you. Um, if you check with Matt, Matt is going to get an email from me in about five seconds, uh, copying engineering, asking for the information that he was looking for. Uh, I don't have every answer, but I will make sure that you get an answer from the person who has an answer. Right. And with that, uh, again, I thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining uh, this uh, particular webinar and uh, we will have for everyone who's listening we'll have another one on May 18th uh, and that will be done by uh, Bobby Haskett with Fabicab and that is understanding and minimizing risks associated with cab interior work and that looks to be 10 a.m. central 11 a.m. eastern time so we look forward to seeing everyone plug in again for that. And thank you again today for joining. All right, guys, stay safe. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. See you guys.